Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain opens with Midge Ur's cover of David Bowie's 1970 track The Man Who Sold the World. Here's a video on why that's genius. The original song by David Bowie, The Man Who Sold the World, was never really well known or popular in its time. He said I was his friend. You might say its phantoms, its memes, have long come to replace the meaning and importance of the original. Though many who hear the song in its many different interpretations now don't maybe recognize its true writer and first performer, it continues to endure not in spite of, but because of this disappearance. That makes the song itself surprisingly more and more meaningful lyrically the older it gets. After all, it's a song about shifting identities and someone who's never lost control because they've been forgotten. Perhaps one of the reasons it remains so bewitching and compelling, at least in part, is due to the song's ambiguities and interpretive fertility. For example, the phrase, sold the world, it could mean tricking the whole world, profiting by betraying the whole world, or both. Some mishear certain lines too, like any good pop song. Form and land can sound a lot like foreign land, while some have also heard gazeless as gazely. This is the nature of all pop songs, which often grow in the hearing as much as the writing and performing. To paraphrase Tolkien, it's a mysterious song that even today, 40 years since it was written, people still argue over its meaning, not unlike Herman Melville's Moby Dick, George Orwell's 1984, or the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche. For Bowie himself, the song represented a kind of sequel to his first breakout single, Space Oddity, something he'd do as a trilogy with 1980's Ashes to Ashes. All three songs deal, at least to some degree, with the nature of persona, mass popularity, idols, and identity. But only the man who sold the world is quite so hypnotic and so chiefly expressive of a disappearance and an almost parasitic unification between two speakers or characters within the same song. Space Oddity was directly referenced by MGS3 with phrases like Planet Earth was blue and Can you hear me Major Tom? But more than just fodder for throwaway lines, Space Oddity would inform the whole concept in MGS3 of Big Boss and the Boss. We could compare them both in some respects to the character in Space Oddity of Major Tom. And ironically, the one in the game who goes by Major Tom, we could compare, perhaps, to Ground Control, the other character in the song. Just as MGS3 is necessary to understand MGS V, Space Oddity is necessary for understanding the man who sold the world, so we'll have to look at it first. Space Oddity, also like the man who sold the world, is that unusual thing in songwriting, a conversation. The song's a back and forth between two characters, as I said, Ground Control and Major Tom. And actually, again like The Man Who Sold the World, the song tells a story with a beginning, middle, and end, also unusual for a pop track. Space Oddity begins with liftoff as Ground Control feeds Major Tom instructions and a literal countdown commences in the song. The chorus is Ground Control reporting in with news about how Tom's trip has been received by the public. The masses are all convinced of Tom's greatness even before the mission's complete. Now it's time for him to actually finish his mission and live up to their legends. But there's a loneliness to these images of you've really made the grade and the papers want to know whose shirts you wear. It's almost as if Tom is just a mannequin, a plastic idol. Then Tom radios back saying that everything looks different now he's actually floating above the world. The refrains here express an almost fatalistic tranquility bordering on powerlessness. It's almost like Buddhism. I'm stepping through the door and I'm floating in a most peculiar way and the stars look very different today. With stars, of course, 
doubling in the lyrics as a possible pun on stars as in celebrities, idols. Tom goes on, explaining, Here am I, sitting in my tin can, far above the world, planet Earth is blue, and there's nothing I can do. Then Tom seems to basically commit suicide. He sings, Though I'm past 100,000 miles, I'm feeling very still, and I think my spaceship knows which way to go. Tell my wife I love her very much, she knows. It sounds as if Tom, tethered to his ship, is going to let it just float them both away, as if he'll never be able to live normally on Earth after what he's seeing now. Ground Control tries to reach Tom, but the circuit's dead. Did Tom shut comms down, or was there an accident? It's left ambiguous. Tom, unaware and unresponsive to ground control anymore, floats further on, now above the moon, continuing to mourn that, contrary to his earlier naivete, planet Earth is blue, and there's nothing I can do. And with that, Tom, realizing that the world will maybe never change, disappears. But what's equally key is the fact that The Phantom Pain would open with the cover of The Man Who Sold the World by Midge Ur, leading such bands as Ultravox. Ur was a major player in the 1980s genre known as post-punk, which may as well have also been called the children of Big Bowie. Post-punk music has been a huge influence on Hideo Kojima, especially the related bands New Order and Joy Division. And they all would not exist, arguably, if not for David Bowie. Kojima would actually comment on post-punk in a roundabout way in his introduction to the MGSV novelization. He described the transition from punk to post-punk along the same lines as the player's realization that he has to become, in MGSV, the true legendary hero in the absence of the real big boss. Post-punk, you see, was born of dissatisfaction with how poorly punk music lived up to the punk ethos. Post-punk was envisioned as a means of fulfilling the revolution's potential, as the true next generation of music to follow that of the Beatles. Bowie, who made one seminal record after the other throughout the 1970s, and who was close with the godfather of punk, Iggy Pop, and played again a pivotal role as an influence on both punk and post-punk, was at the nexus of all of these shifts. But for what it's worth, Bowie, not unlike Major Tom, disliked what he saw far above the world. He disliked post-punk as a pale imitation of his own work, repackaged as he believed it was under the disguise of new technology. The Earth, it seems, had remained blue. Major Tom is supposed to make it back to Earth and complete the circuit, as it were, but instead he gets lost in space, never to return, caught almost like the moon in the centrifugal pull of his own space capsule, his own persona. He passes the Earth and then the Moon, then a hundred thousand miles beyond where he began. And he can never get back home. The Man Who Sold the World, meanwhile, continues the themes of Space Oddity in a different direction. The first song was essentially about the loneliness and artifice of greatness. Major Tom becomes a mass idol, one used to sell shirts and fill the papers, but one that nobody really knows, who's all alone. He himself is totally helpless to these planet-sized forces acting on him beyond his control. Communication itself becomes impossible in Space Oddity, for Major Tom, the man who disappears. The Man Who Sold the World, as I already said, is also about a disappearance. And just as Space Oddity played on allusions to the Apollo launch and Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, Given that even the name David Bowie derives in part from the main character of that film, David Bowman, The Man Who Sold the World took this self-awareness and meta-references to the next level. Surprisingly, a lot of the lyrics are themselves in The Man Who Sold the World a bit secondhand. They come from a poem by William Hughes Mearns from 1899, Antagonish. But the echo effect doesn't stop there. The poem's title is itself an echo of a play from Sophocles of Ancient Greece, Antigone. Just as the play is haunted by a kind of ghost, Mearns' poem is about, in its now famous phrasing, though most who hear it don't know the origin, a man who wasn't there. The poem reads, Yesterday, upon the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today, oh how I wish he'd go away. 
When I came home last night at three, the man was waiting there for me. But when I looked around the hall, I couldn't see him there at all. Go away, go away, don't you come back anymore. Go away, go away, and please don't slam the door. Last night I saw upon the stair a little man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. The poem, of course, is playing on language, on the presence of absence, and how it's sort of a contradiction. How can you refer to something that isn't there? The man who sold the world picks up uh, where Antigonish leaves off, depicting the man who wasn't there from the inside out. Instead of there being two clearly defined and distinct characters, like in the poem, in the song, both over the course of the song are subtly and gradually merged. Like Space Oddity goes from the lyric sitting in my tin can to floating round my tin can. The man who sold the world goes from I never lost control as a statement made second hand to us by the song's Ishmael, that is to say its narrator, to we never lost control as the narrator and the other character start speaking as one and with one voice. The man who sold the world begins with the word we and the image of one man ascending and the other man descending the same staircase without us being able to tell which is which. They strike up a conversation about the past and then Bowie injects the poem's phrase except backwards, I wasn't there. See? Not the man wasn't there, but I wasn't there. It's all building on the wordplay and irony of the poem, which, again, plays with the epistemic confusion of the concept of zero, that is to say, the presence of absence, and how it can be represented in language. How can a man who isn't there be there or be anywhere? It's a paradox, if you will. In the song, the idea is that as the story is told, the listener is struck with a bit of fright. Maybe the two aren't strangers or old friends, we might think, but former enemies. The lines are, we spoke of was and when. Although I wasn't there, he said I was his friend, which came as some surprise. I spoke into his eyes. I thought you died alone a long, long time ago. Maybe in other words, this other man is a ghost come back from hell to haunt the narrator. The narrator tries to disassociate from the other character, something the ghost won't allow. But there's an eerie sense that the ghost has taken a new face and only his eyes are the same. This is perhaps why the narrator doesn't recognize him right away. He's not only a ghost in this reading, but something like a demon who's taken possession of a host, almost like a parasite, and in doing so has cheated death by outliving it, and by so doing has never lost control. A coy nod perhaps to ground control. Then with this realization, the narrator laughs and shakes the other man's hand as if meeting him for the first time. Then he makes his way back home, but never seems to arrive there. For years and years he roams, searching for form and land, a very evocative and curious phrase indeed. Then he gazes a gazeless stare, meaning one that isn't there, a perspective without a name, without form, without an identity. Everywhere he goes, he seems to stay still, somewhat like Major Tom floating around his tin can, in a kind of afterlife where he realizes he and all the millions that he now recognizes are here too are the real ghosts. They're the ones who must have died a long, long time ago. But then out of many forms one, e pluribus unum. Out of their loss, the other men, the millions who've died, and the narrator in the song's closing refrain all join the original ghostly-like character, merging into a single identity, the identity of non-entityness the presence of absence, in a word, the double think that is zero. They're all versions then of a single man, the man who never lost control, the man who sold the world. There's just so much to unpack relative for this to the phantom pain. To begin with, there's a clear connection between the men who pass upon the stair and Ishmael and Ahab, as in Big Boss and Venom Snake. But at the same time, I claim the two also signify in the song, Big Boss and Someone Else, Major Zero. The brilliance is that much like in the song, which one is which is not a case of either or, but to some degree, both and. There are elements of both characters in both. This is a postmodern idea, one that defies so-called binary oppositions. The world Zero has created that Big Boss has created, and for that matter that Skullface has created, are all in fact aspects of the same world. 
Confusing, I know, but stay with me. If we read the opening verse first in the context of Zero, then of Skullface, what do we find? So as we know, Zero comes to visit Big Boss in a coma. It's the very last tape we receive, and even though they haven't been anything close to friends in some time, even though the two were literally at war against each other, Zero talks to the snake that isn't there about was and when, and even literally says he was his friend, old friend to be precise. But is Zero not in reality all but certainly being cruel and ironic in this sequence? Another way to hear his final farewell entirely is as a kind of mission accomplished boast of victory over Snake. There's at least a chance that Zero was behind the raid on MSF. When he and Ocelot discuss it and Zero says, you won't believe who was behind it, listen carefully to Ocelot's code talking response. My hunch was proven right. You wouldn't believe who was behind it. Oh, I have an idea. Oh, I think I have some idea. Oh. Zero. David-o. Is this a secret admission or just a coincidence of language? Is it presence or is it absence? It's a dreadful ambiguity that speaks right to the heart of the game. It's also a case, perhaps, not of either or, but of both and. Assuming Zero did have MSF destroyed and Snake wound up in a coma as a result, why would Snake want to return from the dead, so to speak? For revenge, of course. But by the time he will, Zero's mind, as he's basically bragging here, will already be gone. No real revenge will be possible. He'll be deprived of his enemies. So in this regard, if true, it fulfills the lyrics of Bowie's song, Oh no, not me, I never lost control. You're face to face with the man who sold the world. In other words, you have become me, the vengeful me, that made you who you are. Now let's consider the same lyrics with Skullface instead of Major Tom. Skullface knows Snake, but Snake doesn't know about XOF, at least not in the beginning of the game. And Skullface looks repulsive and does hideous things, yet he and Big Boss's fates are joined at the hip. Skullface's will will live on after his death through the venom he implants in the Patriots system. Skullface and Big Boss, or Venom Snake specifically, literally have a face-to-face -face at the climax of the game, and Skullface talks to him like almost they were old friends. And just like the narrator becomes part of the other man's phantom, by the end of MGSV, Skullface, Big Boss, Venom Snake, Cypher, and all the Diamond Dogs will have merged into one mindset, into a kind of crypto-totalitarian one-party state. To paraphrase Skullface, they will link lost hands, and the world will become one. Whether they've died or roam now as ghosts will be impossible for them to tell. Who knows, not me. We never lost control. Obviously this speaks to the power of music and lyrics to be able to be twisted to mean almost anything. I almost certainly could be stretching a lot here. It's mostly about a creative exercise to showcase the potential power that the song has for MGSV, because that speaks to the Nietzschean maxim that we get in MGSV about interpretations. MGSV was a conceptually fluid game, as I've been trying to intimate with this whole either or versus both and business, just as David Bowie was a conceptually fluid performer. He assumed a whole series of other personas and body doubles who were both him and not him, from Major Tom to Ziggy Stardust to Halloween Jack, Aladdin Sane and the Thin White Duke. He often would combine multiple references together to become a fusion of ambiguity and postmodern artistry. The name David Bowie, as I briefly intimated, combines not only David Bowman from Kubrick's 2001, but also Jim Bowie of Remember the Alamo fame. Remember the Alamo. This arguably is the nature of mass communication and postmodern pop culture, meaning far outpaces reality, and many different possible meanings and interpretations are combined in the instantaneousness of communication. That is part of the epistemic meltdown offered by the postmodern age, and few masterpieces in history, I argue, capture that confusion and ambiguity and, dare I say, horror better than those created by David Bowie and Hideo Kojima. Until next time, boss. Yeah,
Yeah. <laughs> 